This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Get $50 off your first job post at linkedin.com slash twist. Gusto. Running a startup is hard work, but thankfully Gusto makes payroll easy. They also offer flexible benefits, onboarding, and so much more. Twist listeners get three months free at gusto.com slash twist. And Silicon Valley Bank. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped thousands of tech and life science companies plan for the future. Learn more at svb.com slash next. Silicon Valley Bank, built for what's next. Hey, everybody. It's September. It's 2020. We're in the middle of a pandemic six months in and California is on fire. Social unrest in the streets as we see uh, black and brown brothers and sisters being literally murdered in the streets. Uh, it's a tense time in America. It's a very tense time globally. And polarization of wealth, social injustice, fires, the pandemic, um, and, a, and a stock market that is just confounding, uh, that keeps going up while people suffer and tens of millions of people lose their jobs during a pandemic. It's crazy times right now. And I wanted to focus in uh, an episode here of This Week in Startups as we're all going through this to take one of the people who I've gotten to know over my career as someone who's a calming force, super insightful, and exceptional at running organizations. Uh, and, and that man is Zan Delory, and he is the CEO of Survey Monkey. We uh, became friends because um, we had a mutual friend, Dave Goldberg, who passed away tragically. Um, and uh, Xander took over for um, Goldie, as we called, referred to him, and carried SurveyMonkey over the finish line to become a public company. And that allowed a large amount of money to go towards uh, Dave Goldberg's legacy. And for that, uh, I think everybody is really grateful to Xander. And it's great to have him on the program here today to talk about leading companies in a time of crisis. Xander, how are you doing? Hey, Jason, it's, uh, it's good to talk to you and good to see you on Zoom here. Um, as you said in your intro, these are crazy times. They, uh, 2020 is throwing the kitchen sink at us, and I think it's challenging all of us, humans uh, and leaders especially, to um, make some good decisions and, and stay curious and uh, help show people a, a path towards a, an optimized a future with some uh, a better outlook and a brighter outlook than the one we have today. So I'm doing just fine. And then uh, thanks for the good words about uh, Dave Goldberg and Survey Monkey. Yeah. So when did you realize that this pandemic was going to be a truly acute, uh, let's say, generational changing event, not just something that would blow over or something we could contain? Uh, you know, we went into shelter in place, I believe, right around the the March 15th in, in San Francisco. But when did you get an inkling? Because I know you have a global workforce uh, and customer base. When did you realize that this was going to be different? Um, I think it was mid-February. Actually, I, I remember vividly uh, my friend Jen Tejada, the CEO of PagerDuty, hosted a nice dinner and I met Eric Yuan, uh, the CEO of Zoom. And he was talking about just how much inbound um, demand there was around the world as people were beginning to shelter in place or stopping travel and everybody was getting uh, you know up and going on a web conferencing platform and zoom as now the whole world knows is the best product by far um, so I think that was one of the early signs and then you know in San Francisco there was a lot of discussion about travel being shut down people feeling a little bit less comfortable I remember going to the last Warriors game was the Tuesday or Wednesday night with Ned Siegel from Twitter. And we were all looking around at each other being like, what the heck are we doing here? And on the way home in the Uber, we crafted the note, my chief people officer and me, and um, on Wednesday morning, sent it out to move to strongly encourage work from home unless you had a critical need to be in the office. And here we are six months later to the day. Um, and there's no end in sight. We moved our uh, work from home policy to July of next year, which is really just a placeholder until we get a vaccine and we feel comfortable that we can confidently bring people back to the office safely. It was a surreal moment. I think that the NBA game was canceled that Thursday, I believe. It was either Wednesday or Thursday. So you were probably at the game on Tuesday. I think it was the Thursday. 
uh, that the, the the NBA game was actually canceled while the players were on, you know, just getting on the court for the shoot around. That's where it, it really sort of hit home to me. Like if they're canceling an NBA game and people are in the stands already and they're sending them home. They're not even going to let them. Yeah, it was Rudy really tested back. positive. Referees came out and said, shut it down and send everybody out. And you, you saw the announcers on TNT and the fans were just confounded so you know like many times mark benioff has been ahead of the curve here and he he was about five days ahead of us and some of this the other tech companies and in, in terms of moving strongly encouraged work from home at salesforce the prior week so clearly you know just given their scale and their offices and their customers they saw something before the rest of us you're old school uh you've been in corporate america working at various big companies and startups the idea of working from home was not something i don't think you embraced early now you're forced to have an entirely remote workforce how have you as a ceo had to adjust how you manage people um, and how has the company had to change survey monkey specifically so it's it's been the the challenge of our time i think for every executive first off there is no playbook none of us lived through the 1918 pandemic so we didn't really have a uh, a playbook for you know seamlessly integrating to a work from home environment you know survey monkey whether it's through dumb luck or skill we're incredibly fortunate we design code ship and sell software and it's largely over the internet and phone so we don't build a product in a plant we don't rely on retail stores for foot traffic so our business is thriving and we're incredibly fortunate but more important than that jay as you know from working with some of the world's best companies is that we you know over the last several years have have built a management team and a culture and values that really enable us to trust each other to mentor each other to reward and promote people based on uh, on truly good work and treating people with respect and treating customers um, to give them great value for our product so i think that foundation is benefiting us today in 2020 much more than it was in 2019 and 2018 because we lack that physical proximity and we lack that ability to get into a conference room and really read faces and so you know i, I like you and many others i'm tired of kind of staring into a, a zoom screen all the time and you know we, our business is basically headquartered not in San Mateo today, but on Slack. Um, and that's how we work all day. We, we work on Slack, Zoom, and email. And I yearn for the day where I can get back in and have those conversations where you can kind of engage without the latency that is, is you know, yeah. the result of the web. But this is how it's going to be for a while. And there are some benefits. Let's talk a little bit about what the benefits are. You, you do get to, I think you're forced as a manager to really define clearly what people need to get done in a way that is very different than showing up at the office and being a good team member, right? There, there are people who are culture people who come to the office, you see them in the hallway, but now all that interaction is counted for zero. And then all that's really counted, I think, is the actual productivity. So did you find out or have any surprises in your management of people you now were able to see, hey, this person is massively pr productive. I never really realized it, but all of that time walking around the office and the extroverts ruling the roost in meetings, et cetera, goes away. So h how has that changed in how you evaluate human and human capital and, and performance? Yeah, I, you said it well. I mean, I think there is a sense that managers, leaders have had to be more crisp about our strategic priorities. We have 1,300 people at SurveyMonkey. 1,300. We just can't do as many things well as we could when we could all convene and around water coolers and in the offices. And so, you know, we are more crisp, more focused around delivering performance. And the truth is that so much of what we do today can be measured. We can measure lines of code. We can men measure JIRA tickets. We can measure BDR calls, sales booked. So, you know, you're really counting on your frontline managers to manage their direct reports and your their direct reports to manage their direct reports. And ultimately, you know, you hope people don't have more than seven to 10 direct reports. Each manager is really accountable for how are my people doing? Are they healthy? How's their mental health? Are they showing up every day? Are they delivering on the OKRs and the critical objectives we have to measure our success? And I'm sure there are some people inside of our company that are dialing it in a bit. I hope not. But you know, you, you can't see and touch and feel 
as much as you could when we convened in physical offices. But we're fortunate that much of what we do to drive our success is measurable. And that does drive our promotion process, our pay processes. We just completed our biannual pay equity audit. And fortunately, we're paying our men and women and black and white employees the same. But when you really get into the data and you're measuring every line in Excel, it's, um, it's illustrative of, wow, we, we've got a lot to measure and it's harder to do in a remote workplace for sure. When we get back from this break, I want to talk about reentry. Um, it's pretty obvious that rapid testing has worked and trace and track um, and contact tracing has worked in other countries. We've had the worst performance of all countries uh, in our response to this, but it'll be inevitable that the cheap test will be here soon. It'll be inevitable um, that they'll be, we'll know if the vaccines are going to work. Let's just put it that way. But clearly track and trace and, and cheap testing are imminent. So when we get back from the break, I want to know how you think about reentry and the workforce coming back to offices sometime in 2021 when we get back on this week's service. All right, let's get down to brass tacks. I've got $50 to you from LinkedIn Jobs. The market is coming back. I know it's really weird to say, but people are actually hiring because people, entrepreneurs are resilient and they figure things out. They figure out how to save their businesses. And I'm going to give you $50 towards hiring that next great hire. And we got an amazing testimonial from one of our listeners, Jay, who is the founder of uh, something called 10 Golden Rules. It's a boutique digital marketing agency. And he used our $50 credit for the first job post, which I'm going to give you the secret URL for for in a moment well he used that and he put up an account manager position and he quickly received and we hear these stories all the time about linkedin jobs over 150 qualified applications not 150 noisy applications which makes your life miserable qualified and after identifying his two top targets jay noticed that he shared mutual connections on linkedin with both of them so boom he can go vet those hires. And that's the number one thing that I see founders don't do. They don't vet. They don't do reference checks. Those are built into LinkedIn. We know that he hired his favorite candidate over Zoom, and it's worked out great. Congratulations to Jay. Be like Jay. There are over 690 million people waiting for you on LinkedIn right now to do that work, to join your team. I want to give you 5 0 $50 right now. LinkedIn.com slash twist. That's right. Go to LinkedIn.com slash twist to get $50 off. Terms and conditions apply because they're giving you $50 because you listen to this podcast, the greatest podcast in startup history. LinkedIn.com slash twist. Thank you, LinkedIn, for helping me hire so many great people. I cannot thank you enough. It is the best. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Xander Lurie is our guest today here on This Week in Startup, CEO of SurveyMonkey. Previously, he was on the board of Grokker and GoPro and worked at CBS and uh, has a long track record in the tech business. Um, how are you thinking about going back to work? Let's just imagine, I'll just give you the scenario, $10 testing in five minutes is available, you know, at the front door. Vaccines are available uh, and essentially free, paid for by the government, and, and they, they're working, and the number of people dying from COVID is low single digits in the nation, like other countries, or maybe there's been zero last week, and it's pretty safe. And everybody says, hey, we're going back to work. What does that look like for you in 2021, if you were to do that? And then people have moved, maybe, maybe people have relocated. How, how are you planning on even handling that? Have you started that plan? Or did you just punt that and say, let's, let's just focus on the core business for now and, and, and make that decision in six months when we have more data? No, oh, it's a great question. And you have written a book and built a career on investing in startups. And, you know, we know the power of first mover advantage. I don't think, Jason, this uh, first mover advantage in returning to the workplace is something that's going to be highly coveted. So, you know, for us, the reimagination of work, as we call it, uh, is a topic we've spent a lot of time on. We've engaged an outside consultant to help us kind of come in and really think about not just how we go back in 21, but what does SurveyMonkey's footprint look like in 22 and 23 and 24? What are we trying to achieve? Why do we come to the workplace? So for mm. me, there are you know, three top of mind reasons why I'm eager to get us back to work quickly. First, uh, we have a large cohort of employees that want to get the hell out of their apartments. You know, They've got roommates. It's difficult to be productive. Uh, they miss the social interaction with people their age. They really counted on uh, our workforce as part of the social fabric of their life. We have people that are having a very hard time working at home with young kids. So first is just enabling people who really need and want to get back to get back to work. 
Second is um, for our customers, you know, eager to get back to a place where our customers, where we can meet in person, you know, for solutions engineers, for our client facing folks that need to engage with their customers. We know that's, um, we know that's going to be important. And then thirdly, it, it's for the magic that happens when you bring teams together, specifically cross-functional teams. I've actually found that in the last six months, we've had a lot of success managing in our functions. Our, our CTO, Robin Ducat, is managing her function. John Schoenstein is managing our sales function. But the cross-functional teams is where the real magic happens. It's the five people that can share a pizza that are going to be shipping a new product, launching a new campaign, closing the books where you have somebody from legal and finance and product and marketing and bringing those folks together man i miss getting those people back together whether it's around a conference room or for lunch or on a walk or in a design studio um you know your business will be better when they can reconvene so we're we're going to be eager to get back to work but we're sure as hell not going to be the first have you found any uh sustainable culture unlocks while you're remote, uh, you know, ways for people to build culture or to fill in that social fabric while you're waiting to go back to the office, or to enable this cross functionality, and those collisions that occur in offices, when people go for walks to go get a fills to go get lunch, to share a pizza, those kind of things are just so intangible and hard to do in something like Slack or zoom. Have you figured it out? Is there any secrets? I, there's no there's no magic bullet. I would say that the role of HR which used to be, you know, maybe a, a, a second fiddle to product and engineering and marketing, yeah. all of a sudden, you know, is the kingpin. I mean, our right. chief people officer, Becky Cantieri, is incredibly experienced and everybody is now looking to Becky as one of the real leaders in the company who have helped bring us together around what has been this incredibly tense year as you articulated at the at the top of the show so you know for us clearly um you know we do troop town halls where we bring the whole company together every other wednesday morning for a half hour update um i do the goldie speaker series as you know where i bring on yep. ceos and authors and philanthropists and politicians to talk to the company and then it's a lot of fun stuff that our events team and our hr team bring your pet to work day bring your kid to work day um, a lot of mentoring our intern program we had our hackathon that you know we saw some great videos and testimonials so you know we really celebrate our ER, our employee resource groups around pride month uh, black history month um, but no there's no magic bullet it's like health you know every day you can get up and either eat something healthy or pound down three donuts and culture is all about being um, consistent you know, I ate three donuts before we were on air. So thanks you for running me out. <laughs> um, how do you think about Zuckerberg's approach to remote? He said, hey, listen, if we were paying you a premium to live in the Bay Area, and you decide to relocate and work from Nashville, or we're going to adjust your compensation. Now, this was looked at as an incredibly polarizing statement, which Zuckerberg is no, um, you know, it's, it's kind of on brand for Zuckerberg um, to, to, to say something like this, but it does actually make sense when you think about it. If somebody was in a remote employee in Nashville, let's say, and you said to another person who relocated from Nashville to San Mateo, hey, we're going to give you this 25% bump because we know there's a cost of living adjustment and that's reasonable. Now they go back to Nashville. They've essentially given the person in Nashville who didn't come to San Francisco a pay cut because the person who did who does the same job function went back to Nashville. How do you think about that incredibly tough issue? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we like many other tech companies, are fielding inbound requests from employees who want to live closer to home, closer to ailing parents um, in a lower cost location than the Bay Area or New York. I think ultimately, you know, maybe if we had 50,000 employees, I would have to have uh, vision on policies like that. But for us, it's largely about supply and demand. You know, it's can we attract the kind of world-class front-end engineers and account executives and product marketers to achieve the ambitions we have? And if if we can, what do you pay them? You know, and so yeah. what is compensation? It's base, it's bonus, it's stock, but it's also the intangible culture factors and the values that make your company special to work at relative to some of the companies you're reading about in the New York Times that continue to screw up um, around how they treat their people and and you know creating a workforce or workplace that isn't hospitable and inclusive. So, you know, I, I think on the pay based on location, I don't know. I think ultimately um 
you got to pay what the market commands. And we monitor the rat for data and we benchmark against other technology companies and we want to pay our people at the high end of the market. But ultimately, anybody who is kind of hopping jobs for the next incremental dollar is probably not the long-term person that who's going to deliver the most value to your company. Are you finding now that because you're remote and you're I'm curious how the hiring process is going now, do you just say, listen, we're, we're just going to hire anywhere globally or anywhere within this time zone for positions? Or are you hiring still with an eye towards, you know, people going back to work in San Mateo? It's a great question. We, we definitely are continuing our hiring pace. We've slowed our hiring pace from 2019, but that was part of our plan this year. So we had really um, stacked up in terms of our sales and marketing uh, capacity last year with the aim of slowing our hiring this year. But we added about 100 people in Q2 alone. So all of those people were obviously hired over Zoom having not met a single person in one of our offices. We are still hiring with the intention of bringing people back to the office full time. Now, clearly, you're going to have a more flexible schedule uh, than the one we had pre-COVID, but we're hiring with the intention of bringing people back to the centers. That said, we are making exceptions. And I would say those exceptions, uh, particularly where we can hire diverse talent, we are going to hire the best talent we can. And Ultimately, you know, we may be changing some of our policies in 2021 or 22. Whenever we're back full time, uh, we'll, we'll likely have more people working exclusively remotely or partially remotely. How do you keep the second, the group of people who are remote, how do you keep them from becoming second class citizens at the company? We all have had this experience when you're on Zoom prior to COVID and people are dialing in. And you even forget they're in the they're on the call because you've got six people in the room and then there's yeah. two people dialing in. They become by default second class citizens. It's hard to yeah. keep them there. I'm curious, how are you thinking about that? Because when people, I I, I think this is going to become the big decision for executives. Do I want to be by the locus of power? Do I want to be near the CEO? Do I want to have the collision with the CFO, the CTO, the CEO in the office and happen to bump into them and be on their radar? And then if I'm on Zoom and I'm on Slack, you know, maybe I I'm, I'm going to not be top of mind when this promotion comes, not be top of mind uh, when an opportunity to run a new project comes. When we come back from this quick break, explain how you're, you're thinking about uh, solving the, the two-class um, problem when we get back on this week in startups. 2020 has proven to be the year of many things. And if you own a startup, this could be the year you switch to better payroll. Gusto wasn't just built for small businesses. It was built for the people behind them, the founders who listen to This Week in Startups. Their online payroll is so easy to use. Gusto can automatically calculate paychecks and file all of your payroll taxes. Three out of four customers say they run payroll in 10 minutes or less. I know this to be true because we run it in under 10 minutes ourselves, which means you'll have more time to run your business. Less drama, more time. It's super efficient. Plus, they offer unlimited payrolls for one monthly price. No hidden fees. Plus, Gusto does way more than payroll. Gusto also helps with time tracking, health insurance, your 401ks, onboarding, commuter benefits, offer letters, and they give you access to HR experts. And if you're moving from another provider, they can transfer all your data for you. It's no surprise, 94% of customers are likely to recommend Gusto to a friend. Here's the best part, because you're a listener to This Week in Startups, you get three months totally free. That's right, three months for free, just for listening to This Week in Startups. Go to gusto.com, G-U-S-T-O.com slash twist, T-B-O-I-S-T. Again, that's gusto.com slash twist. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. Gusto, thanks for the help and support with the podcast and our payroll. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Xandalore is here and we're, we're chopping it up. I want to get a little bit into what SurveyMonkey is working on. We'll do that in a second. Um, but tell me about the, the, the two class problem and this sort of strata that could, the stratification of, of talent that could occur where, you know, you're out of sight, out of mind. How, how yeah. are you thinking about that? Well, I, I think it's a it's probably the top issue for this reimagining work discussion that's happening with every C suite in America, which is, you know, first off, everything pre Zoom kind of sucked. Like there was no great video conferencing platform that worked consistently, and you could communicate in a in a human way. So, I'm uh, curious why you think you said before that Zoom was just the the best product ever in this category. Why why do you in, in your you study product obviously, and you worked at GoPro, which had the best product, the category killer. You, you've worked at a lot of category killers. What is it about Zoom that makes it the category killer in your mind? 
I, that's so funny because it's not like Zoom came out with the first electric car. It, it what they weren't the first mover in this market at all no. with WebEx and you know Google. But I mean, they're they're multiple products. But whether it's just the design or how intuitive it is or just how how consistently it works, I think we were all so turned off of web video conferencing software just because it was so inconsistent. You never trusted that you could have an important meeting on it. So. I There's something about the reliability. That. I agree. So it's, it's for me, it's the reliability and the f the lack of friction. It seems to just when I would use GoToMeeting or WebEx or some of the other solutions, it, there was too many numbers to dial in, too yeah. much friction to just get on the call. And now it's just like, hey, you're you, you send the URL, they're on the call. It's also the then, network effect of just knowing that everybody else is trusting Zoom, that you don't have yes. to kind of educate them on how to log in and get there 30 minutes before their meeting starts. Yeah, but that's a good lock-in too. To answer your first question yeah. though, I think it really is, um, we have to provide workplaces that are inclusive. We have to enable people to come and feel confident that they can speak up, their voice will be respected. And I think too often it exacerbates the problem where the white guy in the room is loud and interrupting and the person who's on video conference doesn't have a chance, especially if it's not, you know, that you know, extroverted kind of chest beating personality. So I think it's incumbent upon leaders like me to say, hey, these are the prescriptive reasons why we are coming to the office. I've been saying like, no longer are we coming to the office. We're not going to ask you to battle commutes and virus exposure to come have coffee and walk the halls and do email in a cubicle. Now we're going to come with this prescriptive reason. There's a team event. There's a, a rally around sales. There's a a design-focused cross-functional meeting. We're going to come with a prescriptive reason to be in the office. And maybe that means shorter days. Maybe that means less than five days a week. But one of the top of mind challenges is going to be how do we provide for an environment where people who aren't in the room feel included? And you know, it might mean spending more to bring those people to the office on those events a couple times a month. But that's so you're, you're thinking intentionality around the purpose of coming to the office and that you'll even just fly those people in. So hey, we're going to do a three day jam session. We're going to be talking about survey monkeys sales, you know, goals for the next four quarters. And it's going to be a big sales rush. And we're going to have speakers and, and, and you know, debates and, and culture building events, but we're not going to force you to yeah, battle that 101 traffic every day to get here at nine. I mean, that's the big unlock, right? For decades, right? The, yes. The unlock has been for decades like, hey, it's just like school, you know? The bell rings at nine o'clock and there's recess and there's lunch and then, you, you know, you hit the dinner bell at six o'clock and you're out. And now it's more about like, wait a minute, let's, first principles, why the hell are we coming to this place? What are we mm. doing here together? What is the, the goal? Let's start with the ambition, the aspiration, the the thing we're trying to achieve and let that be the reason that we come together. And yeah. let's not, let's not all sit in traffic and spend tens of millions of dollars a year on, on rent and other travel related stuff, unless we need to. So I think that, you know, I, I credit, you know, people like Reed Hastings and others that really strip back all the conventional BS that we've all just assumed, you know, why do you have to wear dress shoes? Why do you have to be at the office by 835 days a week? <laughs> like, why do you have to do, you know, uh, reviews four times a year. And those leaders are the ones that are enabling you to ask questions and unlock all this awesome creativity that we're seeing in the market today. Uh, you've been a big proponent before anybody else, I think, of diversity and inclusion uh, on a corporate level. You famously got Serena Williams to join the board um, and have really championed trying to, to get more women and people of color um, involved in leadership positions. What have you learned on that multi-year journey uh, and leadership position you've had in the industry in this regard, in terms of best practices of how to make people feel included and how to draw that talent to your company. Because a lot of people say, and the, and the cynical thing I hear is, hey, listen, there is a very small population of people um, you know, available for some of these job roles. And now we're all competing for them because we all want our statistics to change overnight. But we hear this pipeline problem, and I'm using that in quotes, is there a pipeline problem? Is that BS? And then how do you actually create the environment that draws people in and wants a, a diverse workforce to actually show up as opposed to trying to convince them to show up? Well, thanks for the question and thanks for the good words. Um, so first off, there is fundamentally not a pipeline problem. Okay. Why do there people is, say there is? Why, why is that like the first thing you hear? And people won't say publicly, yes. but we hear it constantly. I didn't get any applications for my CTO position from a black female or my director of sales. I can't find any more Latino, you know, executives who have five years in SaaS or whatever. Easy answer. It's an easy answer. That's why people because say Because white executives 
have networks that lack diversity. Right. And so you host a party and all of a sudden you have 90 white people at the party and one black person. And then when you go to recruit a black engineer, you're like, God, I can't find a black engineer. Well, no shit. You don't have the network. So it's not a pipeline issue. It's your challenge and my challenge. And that is on us to recognize that the reason we have that challenge is there is systemic racism. The reason venture capital and private equity and technology companies are dominated by white men is because there is systemic racism in the system. It's not an accident that the fifth generation kid from Yale got the job. It's not that he is just way more talented than the black woman from Alabama. It's just that he's been given every advantage in life. And there's some real truth to born on third base. So it's on especially the white allies who are in positions of power with networks as big as yours or capital bases or companies to find what are the things that I can do personally? Where do I have power? Where do I have a voice, products, capital? influence to change the game because opportunity is not equally distributed right talent is and we know this so you know my challenge and you know one of the things we did early was to say hey let's make our board of directors one where when you look at their faces on the screen you're proud to say you work at that company you're proud to say our ceo gives a shit about providing an environment that is diverse, where there is equity and inclusivity is a top priority. And, you know, what I have found is that employees want this. I wanted this when I wasn't, you know, a C-suite executive. I wanted a place that where people were treated fairly, where, you know, the company was decidedly anti-racist. And we have a long way to go. I am not, you know, taking a victory lap by any stretch. We are not diverse enough. We do not have enough black and brown people in positions of power. Um, But we're taking every step we can with our pay and promotion practices, how we're hiring, how much, you know, I spend as much time and money on this as I do on our evaluating our products or hitting our sales goals. And I, you know, my, my message out to every, every CEO out there is like, you're a CEO, you have influence with your board. If not, they're going to bounce you from the job. So take this opportunity to say, I want our board of directors to be diverse. I don't want five white male venture capitalists on our board. And today, um, kudos to our friend uh, Brad Gerstner and Sukinder Singh Cassidy for launching the board challenge. 42 companies, including SurveyMonkey, committed to putting at least one black member on the board of directors. And I think issues like this and issues I saw that like today. That, he was literally, yeah. at the, ta- the day we're taping, he was on CNBC all morning talking about it. Explain what that project is one more time so we all know it. Yeah, it's simple. Um, Brad is a, you know, very celebrated investor. He's got billions of dollars under management. His 12-year-old, you know, after George Floyd was murdered, said, Dad, what, what are you doing about this? Um, and Brad's got a lot of influence on boards like United and others and got Rich Barton from Zillow and me and 40 plus other people um, to commit to put at least one black person on their board of directors. And if you look, I think in the S&P 500, I think there's 187 companies where the board is all white. 187 of the Fortune 500. So we're talking 36%, 37%, one in three is all white. Check, check my math there, but it's a. It's it an seems actually percentage. reasonably true to me. Yeah. It's, it's an absurd percentage. Yeah. And if you think about, I mean, you don't even have a pipeline issue here. Like, this is really just if you're a white CEO and you don't have any person of color on your board, you've got to ask yourself, what do I need to do to make this a priority? Is it important to my employees? Yes, I guarantee you it's important to your employees um, and especially your employees who are black and brown. Is it important to our customers? Well, it should be. Um, is there a shareholder blocking you? There's just no excuse from making this a, a, a mandate that you can deliver on. And there is no pipeline challenge. There are terrific candidates out there. We have Erica James, first black woman to be a dean of a Ivy League school. She's the new dean of, of Wharton. And then Serena Williams, who um, is going to be the all-time winningest uh, athlete in the world. Um, and they're incredible influencers on our board. You know, they are bringing so much value and diversity and perspective and judgment and insight uh, across a whole number of areas. So we've been a huge beneficiary. Um, I mean, Serena will text a recruit, you know, the minute I ask her to. Erica is in the world's most interesting board conversations. And there are so many incredible folks who are available to put on your board who can add a ton of value. It's just this is one of those challenges that should get a ton of momentum. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen.
Uh, when we get back from this final break, I want to talk about the changing role of the CEO and then what SurveyMonkey's business is today and, and what it will be tomorrow when we get back on this week in startups. This week in startups is brought to you by Silicon Valley Bank. What's next? What if? Are we ready? Now what? These are the questions that keep founders up at night, and no one understands this quite like Silicon Valley Bank. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped thousands of high growth companies by providing scalable financial solutions along with insights and expertise that many other banks just can't. From healthcare to hardware, software to infrastructure, Silicon Valley Bank works with companies across the innovation landscape at all stages of the journey, anticipating their needs before they do. And by providing access to insights and in-depth reports, SVB can help you make more informed decisions and assist in turning your great idea into a great business. Which could be why 50% of US-based venture-backed tech and life science companies bank with SVB. Will your business be next? Learn more at svb.com slash next. Once again, svb.com slash next. Silicon Valley Bank, built for what's next. All right, Sandra Laurie is with us. You can follow him on the Twitter, Z Laurie, Z L U R I E. He is uh, on the Twitter, which makes you crazy, doesn't it? Are you, are you uh, doom scrolling every night, Xander, <laughs> before you go to bed or when you first wake up? Or have you, have you, Matt, you seem to have managed your Twitter. You don't have the same addiction that me and Bill Gurley and David Sachs have and other folks in our group of friends. I don't have your fame and celebrity and good looks and influence, so I don't have the the haters that some of you may have. But no, I, I find I find Twitter an awesome place for both for news and understanding trends, and then also seeing all the quirky shit that you put on there. I enjoy. <laughs> um, so, what is the role of a CEO going forward in your mind? What is the skill set that the young people listening to this? you know, who are starting their companies, they're in their 20s and 30s, uh, they might be might be the first company, they just left a big company to start their own company. What do you think the key skills are to being a CEO specifically, not the co founder, because obviously, there's three or four co founders, they don't necessarily go on to lead hundreds of people. But let's just take, you know, when you get to 100 people or more, and you have to actually be a CEO, what is the skill set now in 2020 and going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think there, there's two big buckets of capabilities. The first bucket is, you know, one that's been around for a long time is, I, I would argue, is kind of table stakes, is you have to have the, the analytical skills and the deep interest and insight around whatever the product or service that your company is delivering, whether it's a tech product, a software product, or it's actually a hard good, um, or it's a consulting service or an investment banking product. You have to be... Uh, you have to have the requisite domain knowledge expertise in that product. And then you have to have some analytics to understand pricing, packaging, margins, um, competition, you know, where the industry is going. So that's being a strategist and understanding your market and customers and product, right? Like the classic CEO product market fit. Yeah, I, I don't think you can luck your way into, you know being the CEO of NVIDIA if you don't understand the chip market and the right. evolution of the chip market and where the industry is going and have the analytical kind of mindset to understand development and innovation and pricing, et cetera. So I think that kind of product mindset, domain expertise, analytics is something that's always been important for a CEO. I think it was a lot more of the job, call it pre-internet. Yeah. Today, I think the role of the CEO is increasingly stakeholder driven, which is to say, can I attract talent when the vast majority of the value in my company is not in my supply chains, in my moats, in my patent portfolio? It's in like the design, selling power, innovation power of the humans that are employed by my company. So there's the culture component for motivating your employees. There's the way that you drive customer centricity in terms of your ethos and values with your customers. There's the importance of the policies and the stance you take with the community and the work you're going to do. So, you know, the, the business roundtable last year famously kind of changed the mindset of companies to be shareholder driven, to be stakeholder driven. And I think that really is code for the best CEOs of this generation are going to be ones that really can balance motivating our employees, delivering for our customers, obviously being a top decile stock or, or security for shareholders to own, to be focused on the community. And it really is about that balance to deliver for all stakeholders as opposed to just kind of treating your company like a hedge fund. 
and that stakeholder you know uh addition is critical because the employees used to be kind of forgotten they were considered you know um spokes in the wheel but it wasn't like super critical that you you built this great culture but i guess the talent wars have made it essential and then you have the customers and those customers are, are super sophisticated and demanding now the, the amount of choice they have in just like a SaaS product like yours there's 50 different companies they could use you probably have 10 new customers a year uh, competitors a year pop up correct we do have a lot of competition and i think you said it well um in SaaS businesses and in e-commerce businesses it's actually, uh, while we've seen incredible consolidation and strength and critical mass and scale in the mega cap tech companies, there is still competition. There is competition from AWS, right? There right. are very strong competitors for AWS. There, everything you can buy on Amazon, you can buy elsewhere. Hmm. Um, and for products like ours or our, you know, some of the other SaaS companies, we all have competitors. None of us have this kind of island that you know, we can protect. So it really is about, you know, we, we all design software. And right. software isn't, you know, it's largely not defensible by patents. So if your pricing is bad, if you Or distribution. I mean, the distribution system is completely open. You just sign up. Yeah. So Google what? has democratized the access for, for everybody to bid against your keywords and, you know, your customer acquisition costs. Uh, so really it is about like, can I, can I maintain a relationship with my employee base that can continue to innovate, continue to deliver for our customers, build and sell great software. And as long as you can do that, you're in great shape. But the moment you fall off that treadmill, you hit your head hard. Yeah, you, you really have to have that flywheel going of understanding your customer and your employees really understanding that customer and having empathy for them and keep that flywheel going where you understand them. The original business of SurveyMonkey was just taking surveys and presenting the data. Um, and, you know, people used it for forms, I guess. And Google Docs came out and they added forms for free. So, you know, like... The business then I believe shifted into, hey, you have these panels of people and I can actually use that data to then make better business and, and inform decisions. What is the what are the buckets of the business today for SurveyMonkey if you were to look at it? People who are just using, you know, your forms and survey tools versus people who want to use data and panels of people to to have deeper understanding of their business and markets. You know, the company's 20 years old. We really were one of the pioneers in what we call the freemium business model. And, you know, what we learned is that, you know, today almost 20 million people come on the web to access SurveyMonkey's products. But, you know, we started as a pure surveys business and today it's really evolved as we've moved up market to sell into the enterprise. We really have three pillars. The, the largest pillar is, of course, the surveys business, which you can access for free. You can pay for on the web with a subscription. But increasingly today, enterprises, and we have 7,200 enterprise customers, are buying a bucket of licenses and then access to the product. And why do you survey your, your customers, your employees? It's because you're curious, you want to learn, you want to evolve, you want to work on your packaging, your pricing, your benefits, your services for customers. So the whole notion of kind of surveying people you care about is critical to organization's health. And that's the biggest pillar of our business today. The second is this market research pillar, as you discussed. We have the largest, most liquid panel of uh, respondents in America and you know, someday the world. And today, if you want, if you're Tesla and you want to research uh, Latino buyers who have children and a college education and an ATT subscription and live in a particular part of the United States, you can come and build that cohort of respondents and then survey that, that cohort and we'll charge you for access to that panel. And then, of course, is our CX offering, which was really born out of two acquisitions, uh, get feedback and usability. And this is a hot new category where customers, you know, every company today is customer centric. And this is a purpose built software solution that works and integrates really well with Salesforce and helping companies really build programs that help them collect feedback, but then take action. So if you have an important customer who gives you a low NPS score and she has a VP title, like get off the dime and call that customer. And that CX program is one that uh, many companies today are large. Explain what CX by. is for people who haven't heard that term. Yeah, it's customer experience. And it's really about, you know, that there's the sweet old lady in the Portland airport that used to stop, stop you and try and do a survey or the company that calls you uh, during dinner time and tries to interrupt uh, and get feedback from you on how your, your product experience, your service experience was. And, you know, if you're a big hotel chain or a car manufacturer uh, or consultancy, you need purpose-built software and a structured data program to really measure the health of your clients because ultimately your net revenue retention and your ability to retain those customers is what's going to enable you to differentiate from your customers. And that's really only born out of good software. Um, 
SurveyMonkey has long been used for customer experience, but it was this horizontal tool that you had to configure. And so we've really moved up market uh, to build a software suite that um, delivers on that CX. Uh, so instead of starting with zero and saying, okay, I'm going to study our customers, let's build a survey form, et cetera. You're saying, hey, plug this little JavaScript in. We're now embedded in your software and you can track which users are using which features and you can query them about their use of those features and maybe have an early warning system. Hey, this customer may churn. Hey, this customer keeps getting frustrated by this or they're delighted by this and it's an opportunity to land and expand in the, in the organization. You said it. I mean, think about Steve Jobs, who was often kind of lauded for his design functionality and, and intuition. But Steve Jobs' design intuition was born out of billions of data inputs, <laughs> like right. of being a CEO and product builder for 30 years. And so, you know, if you're a company like Salesforce that has several hundred thousand cloud customers, we think at least a hundred thousand of them need CX software because if you have tens of thousands of customers, you really need to understand the dynamics between what customer cohorts want and the canary in the coal mine and the early warning signals. Um, and really understand like, Hey, our high spending customers like this, our customers on the East coast don't like this. And I don't know, uh, you know, CEOs and product builders who just have this intuition and this gut for everything. Ultimately, um, people who are curious and have a growth mindset need to ask the questions and then how you take that data and how it leads you to take an action, to deliver a different benefit, to change a, a price, to launch a new campaign. You know, you see companies that launch bad ad campaigns all the time and you ask, what the, how did the hell did that get? Yeah, greenlit? some creative person came up with that idea based on no customer feedback or no studying of the customer. You, you have it this happens. incredible panel and insight into America um, and the rest of the world. And I see you release surveys in partnership with a lot of people, whether it's politics, uh, you know, or social justice. What what are the most insightful things you've learned in 2020 about America and Americans? Because when one turns on the television set or reads a newspaper, it's incredibly polarized. And it seems like all the media sources that we used to think were down the middle have all picked a side. They've gone very far to the left or right. And so it feels like almost anytime you turn on media or try to get some true north, you feel like everybody's at war with each other and this intense tribalism. Is that true or is that just our experience from watching media and using social networks? Or are Americans largely in agreement on the majority of issues and it's just the media and social media that make us feel like we're at war with ourselves? I think Americans agree on a lot more than we disagree upon, but the way it's covered, as you said, advertisers tend to flock to certain networks and networks are building programming around cohorts they're trying to attract. So it has pushed people from the middle to the extremes and it does have this unfortunate coverage where we tend to cover sensational news topics and then they tend to get left and right. And, you know, I, I, Unfortunately, the mask has become the most politicized symbol in America, and clearly the administration has something to do with that. But you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple of insights that we've found. Um, we do partner with New York Times, MSNBC, CNBC, and other news outlets that have large audiences to share data that they'll find insightful. We were on MSNBC this weekend, uh, but particularly around on race relations, which has been such an important topic in America, I would argue the most important topic in business since the George Floyd murder um, that really brought it to the fore. Um, Seventy-eight percent of Americans want their CEOs to get engaged, get active in social issues. To say, as far as if you are quiet, you're part of the problem, and if you're not engaged, if you're not leading and taking a stance, you're complicit in in the problems in America today. That's up dramatically from even ten points up from even where it was a year ago, and clearly Americans are asking business leaders in a world where politicians are a bit more impotent on some of these issues to get more engaged. Black Americans will tell you that race today, 77% of black Americans say race is the number one most important issue today. Less than 40% of Americans who are white agree with that. Wow. So clearly you've got a massive disconnect of people who are not affected, who are not discriminated against, who are not feeling the oppression of racism in America are saying it's not as important of an issue as people who are afraid to let their kids drive because they're afraid they might get pulled over by cops. Yeah. Um, it just shows you that, you know, there are cohorts of Americans who are affected very differently by the news of the day. And the advice then to leaders is you have to engage. I mean, whether it was CBS or previous employer or Michael Jordan famously, you know, many people who were celebrities were told, hey, you know, you really don't want to take a side. You don't want to lose half your audience. You want to just 
you know, stay apolitical, stay out of politics, stay out of these charged issues. What you're saying is actually, maybe it's you have to engage them because the expectation now is with your company, you do have to show that you're uh, have some basic level of empathy for people who are suffering in America. Yeah, I, I think it's even more pronounced than that. It is in a world where customers have the decision of where to spend their money. Customers are going to be looking at what are your values? How are you stepping up in times where America needs you? So your customers care. Clearly, your employees care. I mean, Google and Facebook, Facebook could hire every single one of our engineers, product marketers, designers, salespeople. So if we're not standing up to talk about what's important, then our employees are going to say, look, I, I can take my talent elsewhere, frankly, for yes. companies that will probably you know, spend more on, on base. Um, you know, and shareholders like BlackRock, Larry Fink is now saying, look, we, we are investing in companies that, that build their company to cater to multiple stakeholders, not just uh, for, for equity holders. And knowing that those are going to be the companies that stick around long term. So I, I think this is not only an issue of um, you're being asked to stand up, you're going to be forced to stand up or your board or your customers or your employees are going to run you out of your company. And even investors are changing now their mindset on it. So endowments um that empower private equity or empower public markets they're starting to say hey we're, we're looking for some more responsibility taken by these companies and we're going to direct capital and allocate capital where we think it's more just i mean that is a sea change that's a total sea change their lps are saying i'm not going to invest with you unless you have better representation on your management committee i mean i i'll for one i went to investment banking conferences last year when we used to get on airplanes and i'd sit in a hotel with that weird like you know, bed stand behind you and the yeah. investors come in every 30 minutes for eight hours and you drink 12 cups of coffee. And I can remember seeing 50 investors in a day and less than five women and not a single black person. And I told my IR chief, I'm not doing that again. If the investment bank that convenes these mutual fund and institutional shareholders together, if they can't attract a more diverse group, I, I'm, I'm out. And wow. they can learn about SurveyMonkey through our filings. And if that hurts our stock, so be it. But I'm going to take my travels and I'm going to spend my time and I'm going to invest in uh, shareholders that have a more conscious bias towards building a team that is diverse and inclusive and hires women and hires people of color. I, I, the days of talking to 12 white guys in a room, forget it. Yeah. What are your thoughts as we wrap up here on the state of California? Um, this has become a, a pretty acute issue. Many uh, uh, individuals we know, uh, leaders in the industry, are choosing to leave California. They feel that taxes, how the government is run, um, in San Francisco specifically, um, the homeless problem, which arguably is the wrong word to use. It's an addiction and mental health problem, according to the statistics. And, and people who uh, are afraid of being canceled one person who's high profile said, you know, that we're, we're calling a problem of people who are junkies, like literally the uh, candid term for people addicted to heroin specifically. We're, we're conflating that with homelessness, and that's why we're not solving this problem. Um, and they wouldn't obviously say that publicly, but that, that's how they view it. What are your thoughts on the state of San Francisco and California in relation to high functioning businesses? Because you must be thinking, uh, you know, or, or, or must have people considering leaving California for these issues, and therefore your business is based here. Would you ever see SurveyMonkey leaving California like some other companies have uh, now done? It's such a fascinating binary set of considerations. So California, not only is it the home to you know some of the world's most beautiful places and beaches and redwoods, um, uh, national parks like Yosemite, but we also are the home to the export of the three best products categories in America, if you think about it. internet services, cloud services, entertainment, yep, yep, and probably electric cars. Yeah. So, you know, transportation, we, we this, transportation, yeah. we're this incredibly thriving place of business and industry, but we have this reputation for being this kind of leftist, you know, crazy liberal, um, State out of and control, it really is yeah. out of control. You know, it's a it's a it's a state with multiple different areas that probably have very little nexus between them. Um, clearly, I think high taxation will be a detractor for a lot of companies that want to set up shop there. But there's a reason companies set up shop in California is because there is access to incredible talent. People want to live in California and, and avail themselves to all the beauty and benefits of the state. Uh, I think the forest fires are 
are you know becoming too consistent it's clearly a climate crisis uh result which is super scary but yeah the policies have got to get better i mean i have so much respect for daniel Lurie and what they've done at tipping point and trying to get more services especially for true homeless people that need help and access and i think you're right we're conflating drug addict with true homelessness in a in a place that is very hard to afford cost of living um but boy policing and crime and the the systemic racism and how we jail our citizens if we don't address these issues america will take a step back yeah and and are you optimistic I i'm am curious optimistic. you're optimistic yeah why why are you optimistic because it, you, we just described a, a racially unjust society policing problems and taxation problems homeless problems i mean this is a laundry and climate like this is a big list of things that need to be fixed why are you positive and optimistic i think capitalism and democracy are super challenged but they're by far the best uh societal uh structures for for how you how you grow and thrive i mean in many ways the business world has a has an opportunity now more than it ever has our power today in america is so much disproportionately higher than it was in prior generations and business leaders have an interest in stepping up to right the wrongs of prior generations and so if you look at what bezos is doing for climate change if you look at what benioff and others are doing around racial injustice you know business is an incredible platform for change we have huge yeah. capital bases and influence with our products with our employees with our our money to affect change and you know ultimately politicians will will vote for what we ask them to vote for and if we get the right folks in there with the right interests um i'm i'm incredibly optimistic about the future and i think climate crisis is probably the scariest long-term challenge that prior generations never had to encounter but boy we've got a lot of motivation to fix it and you know when you get red alerts on your apps and you have homes burning you know 50 miles from your house we got to get our act together and make the kind of change before it's too late. It, it's very clear now that this is an acute situation. This is not like some fake news, whether it's the Great Barrier Reef or California fires. I mean, it, it, the evidence is there. And so now it's just the will uh, to actually deploy the solutions that we know will solve it, whether it's nuclear, whether it's solar. You know, the, the, the solutions are right there. I mean, even for water, we, we had zero mass water on and you know, we have panels that cost $2,000 that can provide a couple of cases of clean drinking water from, you know, just um, taking water out of the air. So we could solve all of these problems just by deploying solar panels, nuclear and water. We could solve the COVID crisis if we just wore, wore masks. masks and had rapid <laughs> testing. So there are there are solutions to our challenges. And I think there are entrepreneurs and philanthropists that have the capital and the mindset and the vigilance to get after it. And you know, defend humanity. So I, I'm, I'm super hopeful, although, you know, the, the journey to get there is painful and there's a lot of human wreckage associated with it. Yeah. I mean, that, one, of the, one of the good pieces of news is that we see examples of this, what Bill Gates did over the last decade in Africa and on, you know, with poverty, we've seen individuals of, you know, the, with the ability to execute and the, the checkbook, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has done just some extraordinary things in lowering just people living in abject poverty. It's, it's stunning. And if Bezos gets his mindset on, you know, global warming and a couple more people get behind it, yeah, I think we can solve these problems. And, and it really is strange that it's an execution problem. Like, isn't America good at executing? We, we seem to be lost our ability to execute on a plan. And I don't know if that's just Trump or what it is or, or the infighting, but we have to be able to have a plan and execute against a plan. Yeah, it's super disconcerting to see how poorly we have executed relative to other countries on the COVID crisis. But, um, you know, this administration, maybe their days come to an end not too far away. And yeah, people like Bill and Melinda, I mean, just think about you make 100 or $200 billion and then you turn all of your focus and talents and capital against solving some of these societal ills that you're right, there are solutions. We can feed everybody on this planet and we can- No big deal. We can- we can fix our water challenges and our energy crisis, um, but it takes incredible vigilance and political will. And for unfortunately, the latter has not been there over the last few years. Yeah, and sometimes it takes a crisis to maybe appreciate things. What, as, we, as we close here, what do you appreciate about life more in month six of shelter in place and the pandemic? I, you know, I think my, I have a keener appreciation for just the, the human connections that are really important to your 
your stamina and your heart and what 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 fills your cup every day and gives you the energy and love to to fight hard and so it's you know as you know with with Jade and your kids and you know the 10 or 20 or 30 friends that you care most about and the production team at launch and your podcast that you care most about like we don't need more friends you need friends and family that that fill you up and give you that energy to to leave it all in the field and i think in covid i've recognized that more than ever um it's a bit of a cleanse of like what's really really important to my health my family my company the community um and that's been a good reminder it certainly clarifies when you pause like this i have to say like the, the pause has made me realize wow like this is what really matters, right? And these friendships are what matters. And, and, and I consider you one of those friendships, Xander. And right back at been, you. Yeah, it's great to have you on the podcast. And um, thanks so much uh, for everything you do and, and the leadership you provide to our industry. SurveyMonkey is hiring. It is one of the great culture um, success stories in our industry. And uh, if you're looking for a job, I would suggest going to surveymonkey.com right now. You're looking at their job page and their careers page. You couldn't work for a better human being than Xander Lori. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate yeah, Jay, it. Thanks for having me and your, your access and influence and the network you've built and your ability to kind of spread messages. Um, you're doing incredible work and I wish you and your team continued success. So thanks for uh -huh. having me today. Thanks for that, pal. All right. Uh, hopefully I'll see you in person before the end of the year. Oh, Maybe we I, can share I a steak or something. That. Please. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Take care, pal. Talk All to right. You soon. Take care. Be safe. <laughs>